What's going on everybody? Welcome back. This video we're going to be talking about stacks. Now this video is going to be a little bit thinner than a lot of the other episodes, but as I guess I just want to get this information out and then we're going to start a project. So just as a little trailer, we're going to be creating a maze solving application and we're going to use a stack. Now the previous episode we talked about queues and they work very similarly so if you understand queues, you can easily pick up stacks. So the way it works is you can think of a stack of plates. If you set a plate down and then you put a bunch of plates on top, if you wanna get that bottom plate, you have to take all the others off first. So the first plate in the stack is going to be the last plate out of the stack. So it's first in, last out. So I'm just gonna show you a little sneak peek of that code and it's okay that you don't have this code, we're gonna get into it. I thought I would just go through some examples before I just jump in just to make sure I, I understood what we're doing. So we start with some kind of maze and you can think about it as a zero being a wall, a one being an open space, and you have to find the two. So the two is the destination. Maybe it's some cheese that you're hungry for and you wanna go find. Let's say you start here. What this maze, will, this maze solver will actually do is it'll go down, down, and then to the left and say, hey, we found the cheese. So that is what we're going to do with a stack. And you can see we're actually using a, a linked list just like we're using right now. And what we do is we every time we make a step, we push our position onto that stack to keep track of where we are. And then if it doesn't work out, we can backtrack and pop that position off of the stack. So that's just a little teaser and we'll get into that in the upcoming videos. We're gonna first talk about the basics of stacks, some of the methods, and then we're gonna talk a little bit more about linked lists and iterating through them and so forth. So we got a little bit more information before we get into this, but that's okay. So let's just take a look at what we got. This is for a queue, so not a stack, queue here. Run this, you can see we put Caleb in first and it's the first one to come out. So it's like a line to a roller coaster. The first person in line is the first person to get to ride the roller coaster. Stacks are a little bit different. And instead of using add, we're going to use push. And the only difference here is where it gets put in the list. So if you hover over it, you can see pushes an element onto the stack. In other words, inserts the element at the front of the list. Add on the other hand, it adds the element to the end of the list. So we can just change where we're putting the elements to basically change how the the list works. First we're using it as a queue and now we're going to use it as a stack. So we'll update that last one by saying push and now we can still use remove because uh, there's another method you'll see which is actually pop and these actually do the same thing. If you hover over pop you can see it removes and returns the first element of the list. If you hover over remove you can see it retrieves and removes the first element of the list. So it does exactly the same thing. There's also remove first. There might be some minor differences between these. I'm not 100% sure, but that's something you can research if you want, but for our purpose, they effectively do the same exact thing. So we'll just leave them all like that for now. And for a stack, Caleb should be the first one in, the last one out. So when we run this, you can see Sally comes out first, Sue comes out next and then Caleb. So you can kind of think of it literally as a stack. First we put Caleb, then we put Sue, and then we put Sally. Then when we take them out, we go Sally, Sue, and then Caleb. Now just to prove my point about the methods being exactly the same, we could keep all these as remove, and then run this, and you can see we still get Sally, Sue, Caleb. We could put them all to pop, And you can see we still get Sally, Sue, Caleb. And then lastly, we'll just show that last example, which was remove first. And in this situation, we run this and we still get Sally, Sue, Caleb. So whatever method you use, it seems to work exactly the same way. And you can even hover over remove first and you can see it says, uh, actually not remove first. If you hover over pop, you can see that it says this method is equivalent to remove first. So pop and remove first are the same and 
remove seems to be doing the same thing, but maybe there's some minor differences. Let's find out, actually. Aha, I know the difference just by looking this up. So, uh, oops, okay, go back. <laughs> the primary difference is you can pass in an argument to remove to specify which index we want to remove. That way, you don't always have to remove that first element. But in a situation where you don't pass any arguments in, if you just leave it at remove, it defaults to the first element and works just fine. But if we pass in a number here, it looks like we'll probably get a different overload removes the element at the specific removes the element at the specified position in the list. If we get rid of that number and hover over it, we get rid of trees and removes the head or the first element of this list. So that is an example of overloading. Uh, we talked about that in my Java series. Basically, it's a method with the same exact name, same purpose, but takes two different sets of arguments. In this case, we have an overload that takes zero arguments, and then we have an overload that takes one argument. You can see those overloads by saying names dot remove. You can see there is one, two, three overloads for the remove method. One that takes nothing, one that takes an index, and then one that takes the object that you want to remove. So if you hover over that one, removes the first occurrence of the specified element from this list, if it is present. So cool. Got a little bit of taste of overloads. And it seems that all these are exactly the same. So we talked about how the stack is useful for backtracking, and I showed you the maze code, how anytime we take a step in this maze, we push onto the stack a new position, and this keeps track of where we are. And then if we go back, all we have to do is pop that position off, and we'll be back to where we were. We can do a very similar kind of thing with method calls. So we haven't talked a lot about method calls, but we're, we're doing them all of the time. You see, when we do something like print line, we're just invoking that method. And there needs to be some kind of way to keep track of what methods a program is in. That concept is known as a call stack. So if you search call stack, you can see that it's a, uh, a stack data structure and it stores information about the active subroutines of a computer program. Put in English, rather than thinking of the word subroutine, just think the word method or function. They're all essentially the same thing. And anytime you invoke a method, there's something added to that stack, the, the call stack, and information is stored to know exactly how to get back to where we came from. In this page, you can find a little bit more about what gets put on the call stack. So if you scroll through here or just search for it, you can find this thing, stack frames. And a stack frame is kind of like a snapshot of the state for a particular method or subroutine as it's called here. So examples of what might be on the stack frame for a particular method would be the locals, so the variables inside that method, the parameters which were defined for that method. So you have a bunch of these stack frames on top of each other to create the call stack. You may have seen something similar when you get an exception in your code or you're doing some debugging. There's something known as a stack trace, which is a preview of these stack frames. So you can see how which methods your code went through. So to show an example of this, in our code, you can see we can potentially throw this exception file not found. And I just realized we actually don't need that. That was from a previous episode where we were reading from a file. So I apologize, I accidentally left that in there. I'll, I'll be sure to remove that when we don't need it. But something like this. If we have, let's see if I can remember the syntax. No, nope, that didn't work. Scanner, we'll just call it in new scanner and we pass system.in. Yeah. <laughs> that's how you do it. Then we say in dot, actually, that's all we need. No, 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 we say in. Uh, we don't want system in though, that's to get it from the console. We wanna get it from a file. So to do that, we can just say new file and just pass in some file name test it's not gonna exist. So it could throw this exception. If we get rid of this, we'll get an error. 
you can see in the problem section, we have unhandled exception type file not found exception. So an alternative way to deal with this besides just saying, hey, this could throw an exception, deal with it. What we can do is say surround with try catch. And it's going to look something like this. We can catch that exception and we can print the stack trace to basically see what steps were taken in our code to get to this exception. So now when we run this, uh, cancel, we got an error. Yeah, I don't know where that came. Oh, I accidentally typed in sysinfo earlier. We don't want that. Get rid of that. Um, and I think that's good. So we'll run this. And in the console, you can see we get a file not found exception and a stack trace. So you can see a bunch of other things happen, but the one we'll probably recognize is the main call, which is where the program starts. That's what we're coding in. And you can see the issue comes from line 13 and it's at the bottom of the stack. Then all these other things happen and things explode and we have an exception. So if you're pretty good at debugging, you might be able to look at one of these stack traces, especially when you have a lot of your own custom methods that you can follow. And you might be able to get a little bit more useful information. But for me, this doesn't help me a whole lot right now. It's easier just to see file not found exception and look for the scanner and realize, oh, I'm trying to open a file that doesn't exist. So we're not gonna need this anymore though, so I'm just going to get rid of it. And I also got rid of that throws exception up at the top. So our code should be good. And I'm gonna commit this as a stack example. My freaking nose itches, dang. So we will save, make sure there's no errors. I'd like to check that beforehand. There's some warnings for these imports, but I just like to keep those because I don't wanna to have to worry about bringing them in and then getting rid of them and so forth. But for your final product, you probably don't want a bunch of imports that you're not using, but for now it's fine. So do as I say, not as I do. All right, so let's go in here and say git status, and we'll say git add, and you're gonna type it out because you could say dot if you don't have that maze file because I was dorking around with that, but because I don't want to commit that maze file, I'm gonna type it out manually, my sweet program, source, my sweet program dot Java. So I added that, so when we say git status, you can see it's green, and then we can say git commit m, convert q to stack, or as my wife likes to call it, a QEUE, enter. Git push origin master. And now it should be up in GitHub. So that is your introduction to stacks. You can see they're used in a lot of different things. One last thing is there is what's known as stack when it comes to memory. So an area of memory called the stack. This is a little bit different, but it does follow the stack data structure. So if you understand how the stack data, the data structure works, you should be able to pick up the stack memory part as well. So don't get the two confused. They're not exactly the same. When people say variables are stored on the stack, they're talking about an area in memory that has the structure of a stack. When they're talking about a stack, they're talking about the data structure stack. So just a little tip for you guys. And Check out the next one because we're going to learn some useful information and you don't want to be a quitter because then you'll be a loser. You'll lose your job or not get a job. You'll live in your parents' basement for the rest of your life and uh, they'll probably kick you out and you'll be homeless under a bridge and etc. So don't do that. Stay with this. Focus on the next episode. Peace out.